I'm Dr. John Bruce, and this week I'm going to be talking about why don't we have a cure for ADHD? This may seem obvious to some and not, not obvious to others, and opinions may vary, and I'm going to get back to this at the end, but wouldn't it be nice to just calm the constant chatter within your head without needing to resort to medications or substances like marijuana or alcohol? Wouldn't it be nice to be reliably getting to places on time? Follow up on things you had started. Wouldn't it be nice to not blurt out comments that embarrass yourself or embarrass others or get you in big trouble? Wouldn't it be nice to be seen as not the weird one in the group, the neurodivergent one, the one who just doesn't fit in? Clearly, ADHD can cause lots of misery. It can cause lots of problems in society as we have it set up. It kills people. This is a serious condition. You know, a child with ADHD is likely to have 10 years cut off their lifespan. Now, that doesn't mean every kid with ADHD dies 10 years early, but on average, this has a big impact on mortality as diabetes does or does depression, all of which shave about 10 years off your projected lifespan. So this is a serious condition, causes lots of suffering and misery. It also brings benefits with it, and I'll get back to that, but wouldn't it be nice to have a cure for it? And my simple answer is we don't have a cure for it because we don't understand completely yet what it is, and it's pretty hard to treat effectively or eradicate condition where we don't know what it is, and it gets worse than that. So worse than that by meaning all the evidence we have is that this is ADHD is the extreme end of a normal continuous distribution of ADHD symptoms. And that means that this isn't something discrete and categorical, so it's not like cancer, I would say, is not on a spectrum. You have uh, aberrant mutations in certain cells. They grow in certain ways. They're gross is excessive. You know, cancer is a bad thing. They're benign. There are cancers that grow very slowly. There are cancers that aren't likely to kill you. But cancer is categorically a different thing than what your normal cells are doing in your body. Again, with ADHD, all the symptoms we have for ADHD are symptoms that all normal people do at least some of the time. And it's the distribution of the frequency or propensity to do many more of them and to do them to a level or extent where it's causing problems. But a continuous distribution problem is less likely to have a ready cure than something that's categorically different, because with something that's categorically different, we can interfere and intervene with what makes that different. We know that there's a very strong genetic component to ADHD. Why don't we just find the gene in with our new CRISPR technologies we had around for a decade or so and are being used now Clinically, there's some people with sickle cell anemia, for example, who the results aren't out yet, but it looks very encouraging that where we have a condition caused by one single gene deficit, defect, CRISPR can go in, put in either an active version of the gem or SNP gene or SNP out the bad gene, and you can restore functioning and have a normal, hopefully healthy person. And there was early evidence that certain candidate genes, certain genes involved with the dopamine transporter molecule, certain dopamine receptors, particularly dopamine 4 and dopamine 5 receptor genes, and also a few genes related, I would say, to more brain growth and neurite outgrowth, how cells connect and reach out to other genes. Some of those were linked or had suggestive evidence in certain family groupings with ADHD, but the bulk of the genetic studies in the last decade show that there is not going to be a single gene that causes ADHD and therefore fixing that gene can fix you. So the evidence we have so far is that ADHD is polygenic, probably hundreds or thousands. You inherit the bad or the ADHD predisposing variant of hundreds or thousands of different genes, and that's what greatly increases your propensity 
But even then, we know that there are environmental factors that have to unfold one way or another because the genetics aren't completely determinative. And if you had to go in and change a hundred different genes or a thousand different genes, I mean, just the magnitude of changing it and the huge likelihood you'd be causing other genetic problems make that extremely unlikely that that's going to be a mechanism for curing ADHD. So beyond the origins having some genetic role, what are these genes doing? Our understanding is we can see differences on a group level. If we look at a group of ADHD people, a group of non-ADHD people, connections to different parts of the brains have are apparently strong or apparently weak. It's not just, I mean, even though our medications focus on changing dopamine or dopamine and norepinephrine levels, ADHD is not just a simple dopamine level problem, just as even though we sometimes misleadingly oversimplified depression as just being a shortage of serotonin, that's clearly not what depression is, even at a simple biochemical level. ADD isn't just a simple dopamine problem. I mean, if it was, then presumably our medications, including the stimulants and the non stimulant agents that adjust, very make more dopamine or norepinephrine available or change how effectively you can use it, would be curative. And they're very clearly not curative. They're effective therapy for mitigating, lessening symptoms and helping people function better. So if it's just a connectivity problem and a wiring problem, maybe some surgical intervention will, will suffice. Clearly, simply going in and chopping big chunks of the brain aren't going to cure ADHD. I mean, I, I should add, though, that there are surgical invention interventions or some really severe and intractable, otherwise untreatable OCD, for example, that do seem to have response to surgical interventions. But again, the number of areas involved with ADHD, the fact that it's more strength of connections or cortical development thickness of the cortex there seem make it seem highly unlikely that we're going to cure ADHD with a simple surgical intervention. And maybe we need to think much bigger and change society. I'd say maybe we have a better way to cure ADHD by changing society. And clearly, individuals with ADHD are treated differently and more embraced by society, by some societies than others. I would argue maybe we'd have more success looking for cures or looking for ways to appreciate all of our differences and finding solutions for each individual that incorporate working towards their strengths and compensating for any weaknesses or deficits. Quotes I like from Ed Hallowell, several times I've heard him speak, what's most important for someone with ADHD is finding the right partner and the right job. And all of us need you know, a good environment, both people we live with and what we're doing, but the supporting environment is arguably but quantitatively studied more crucial for people with ADHD. You need the right amount of structure, not too little, because you'll be flailing and going off track too often and not too much, because then it will be too boring and over-constrained and unproductive. Another angle on this curative approach. One thing we do know, I mean, in contrast to the dogma of 30 years ago, where every kid who had it outgrows it, this is my summary of the statistics. You might see precisely slightly different numbers different ways, but I think it parses out pretty well. 30 kids with ADHD do seem to outgrow it fairly substantially, if not completely. Another third don't seem to get much better. The middle third gets somewhat better, and it may be that developmentally it's showing up differently at different ages, or they found more useful strategies for themselves, or they found a niche either then with the people around them or the job they're doing that just fits them better. If we had indications, if we could tell which kids are going to outgrow it and which kids aren't, that may give us actually profoundly powerful insights as to early life treatments that may put more kids in the category for outgrowing their ADHD. There's at least one study, and I may be jumbling it a bit here, but that suggests areas of the caudate nucleus were pretty 
good trait markers for having ADHD. Kids with ADHD have some abnormalities that are called a nucleus, an area deep in their brain. Those seem to persist even in the kids who have through their ADHD in adulthood. On the other hand, there are areas of the frontal cortex where we think more of our executive functions reside, and with some of the frontal cortex differences, kids who outgrew their ADHD showed it seemed to outgrow the, the abnormalities in their frontal cortex. So that may be the beginnings of some indication of maybe treatments that are applied more to that area of the brain. And interesting, and, and I'll bring this up because it's widely misunderstood and ignored by the general public, stimulant medications clearly have the potential for dangerous interactions. There are side effects that can be really severe, really bad, including addiction, including psychosis. Those are uncommon, but they are clearly there. These are medications with a potential for danger. They also have a huge potential for helping lots of people. So it makes sense that parents are wary about it, but I think many parents are overly rejecting. And why I'm saying this is one of the fears or claims is stimulant, bad drug, rots your brain, rots your kid's brain, is going to be destructive to the brain. More than three dozen studies now, and almost all of these are in children, looked at children with ADHD who took stimulant medications versus children with ADHD who didn't take stimulant medications. And looking in these are mostly anatomical studies, looking at anatomical markers in the brain, and some of them were functional brain, some of them were neurochemical as well. None of them that I'm aware of were looking at real-world functioning. But anyway, of the studies, more than three dozen studies showed that kids who took stimulants while their brains were growing had brains that anatomically, structurally, neurochemically looked more normal than the kids with ADHD who never got their medication, stimulant medication. So it completely switches around the claim or fear or scaremongering that these are going to rot kids' brains strongly suggests that kids who had treatment early on have brains that look more normal as they get to adulthood. And part of that may fit with neuroplasticity and sort of anything that's helping you function better, helping strengthen pathways that you'd want to strengthen. There may be some lasting benefit for that. Clearly, most of our evidence suggests that there are windows of opportunity and that the young brain is certainly much more neuroplastic in terms of more flexible, more responsive to what it's doing. But there's a little evidence, I mean, particularly other psychiatric conditions like panic attack. We know that something like cognitive behavioral therapy is a very effective treatment for panic attack. And that we can see neurochemical structural changes in the brain, maybe combinations of medications, maybe combinations of cognitive behavioral therapy, maybe some of the, as I was talking about last week, there are new video games, and whether we call them games or treatments or therapies, to practice treating these more healthy, more efficient ways of working. Maybe those are going to have some long-term beneficial effects, not just direct intervention treatment effects, but long-term improving ADHD. Many people with ADHD, I'd say probably most, identify at least some things that they particularly like about their ADHD brain, whether it's curiosity, whether it's greater creativity, whether it's sort of a spontaneity and enthusiasm about things, whether it's being more risky or thinking outside the box. And for many people, those traits are embedded in their sense of who they are. So the one question is, how much of that might we lose? Should we find more effective cures or treatments for ADHD? So I'd say right now, most of the treatments we have enable people that I've worked with to make more use of their talents or direct their creativity in more productive directions. So have a good and healthy I'd say on a political and national world sense, uneventful week, and I will be back next week. 